Welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining us. I am Kira Epstein, the co director of the New School at Commonweal. I am here with Brenda Salgado, director of the Racial Healing Initiative at the Retreat Center Collaboration. And we're so honored to co present the third and last conversation in our Restoring the Heart of Our Relationships Racial and Earth Healing series. Today, Brenda is going to be in conversation with Pat McCabe, a Diné elder and ceremonialist, talking about the ceremonial work they did together at the recent Three Black Men event offered through Commonweal's Center for Healing and Liberation, and offering insights on how racial healing and earth healing are connected. Brenda will introduce herself and Pat in a bit, but I just want to thank you, Brenda, for taking time to work on these three events with us over the last few months. It's been a real pleasure to work with you and also to thank Pat um, for being with us, taking time to be with us to share some of your stories. The first conversation in this series was in October with cultural practitioner and educator Grace Sesma. And the second conversation was last month in November with Indigenous attorney, activist, and author Sherry Mitchell. The recordings from both of these conversations are posted on our website at tns.commonweal.org and on our media sites. You can find the recordings on YouTube, SoundCloud, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and Amazon Music. Many thanks to West Marin Fund for providing some of the funding that allowed us to offer the series and to offer Spanish interpretations. Thank you so much to our wonderful interpreter, Flavia, for all your hard work. A big thanks today to Ken Adams behind the scenes. He helps us with production, and you will also hear his voice on the voiceovers in our recordings. That's always nice. Okay, we are ready. I'll turn it over to Racial Healing Initiative Director Brenda Salgado. Welcome to the New School of Commonweal. Thank you so much, Kira. I'm so grateful to be here again. It's been a real joy to be in this with you and thank you for the invitation. And I'm just delighted to be able to speak with three women I deeply respect, love and admire in this series on matters that are really important to our hearts around the healing work in the world right now. And so I'm very grateful to beloved Pat McCabe who I've known for years now. And just the first time I met you, fell in love with you and, um, I'm grateful that you took the time to be with us here tonight. Um, thank you, thank you, thank you. A thousand thank yous. <laughs> thank you, and a joy and a pleasure to be with you, Brenda, and thanks for having me here and love doing uh, things with the community of Commonweal as well. Yes, yes. And um, I'll just share for those who are joining us for the first time, if you weren't on the other calls, my name is Brenda Salgado. I'm the daughter of Carlos and Esmeralda Salgado. I'm actually at their house this evening. Uh, I wasn't in the other two calls. Um, we have three elders in our family with uh, Alzheimer's and dementia, my papa and my two older aunties. And because one of the caregivers in the family is traveling in Nicaragua, um, me and my sister are doing tag team helping out here. Uh, helping mama with papa and and uh, just being present as it is true in our in our families and our cultures we take care of each other uh, and my mom and dad were both born and raised in Nicaragua and they came to San Francisco to get married and so me and my brother and sister were born and raised here in California in Northern California um, in Daly City and now I live in San Leandro, not too far from here. And I'm very grateful to the lands here that have held me and uh, work, honored me and guided me. And I'm also grateful to the lands in Nicaragua that held my ancestors for so many generations. So I'm just wanting to honor the people in the lands that I come from. I'd invite you to do that if you would like, Pat McKinney, before we start. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So um, I'm Pat McCabe, uh, also known as Wiyakpa uh, Najimi, Woman Stand Shining. And um, I'm actually greeting you from New Hampshire, so I'm not at home right now. Um, I'm, I'm actually kind of pleased that my dismal uh, hotel room looks pretty decent on Zoom right now. <laughs> so, 
but I'm actually in um, Abernaki territory uh, here in New Hampshire. Um, but I normally live in northern New Mexico, and so I greet you and say she ate ya, touch in the shri, at all, ashi bashish chi, my dishkej ne dashanale, plash chi dashi che, but I was done in the shri. Um, so like, telling you about my clans, and um, I, just, I want to, you know, you gave a little bit of your your context too, Brenda. So I just wanted to say a couple things, um, which is that you know, and, and it's it's really pertinent to me today in particular, but um, my uh just so you know who's speaking to you, my family, my, my grandparents and my parents were both taken into Dutch Christian Reform Missionary Residential Boarding Schools. And those boarding schools were um, a part of a, a campaign and a, and a strategy for, um, for uh, gosh, I always lose that word every time, assimilation, I got it there, um, assimilation of indigenous people into this superimposed nation state on this continent's way of thinking and being. Um, and so when I first came to this uh, earth, uh, the, my family members were not speaking the language and they were not practicing our culture. Um, and so for me, that was a process of retrieval and coming back home over a number of years. And ironically, today I'm, I'm over here in New Hampshire visiting Phillips Exeter Academy, which is a another kind of boarding school, a prep school on the East Coast, and it's considered to be very prestigious in terms of academics. Um, and yet it was also had a certain amount of trauma involved for me. So this, mm -hmm. I'm just having this ironic day around that history of my family and then my own history here. And um, But I just feel like saying that because uh, sometimes people take a look at me and they just assume that I had it already made for me and I was just born right into it. It was so easy. But hey, I got to fight for it too, just so everybody's clear. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's important to honor those histories. I'm glad you mm -hmm. said that, Pat, because my family is both indigenous Chorotega from Nicaragua, but also Spanish European. And there's so much that happened in our family, right? Around uh, the Spanish side of my family really denigrating my indigenous side or, mm. you know, even, even within my family. I just remember when I stepped on the medicine path and, and grandma and ancestors guiding me on that. I remember my dad saying, oh, Brenda, I think she's Indian. And I said, I don't think I am. I am. And you are too. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. <laughs> the same thing happened to me. Yeah. Yeah. And a lot of fear from some of my aunties, you know, that we're caregiving for right now uh, that I mentioned, um, of, of a lot of fear when I stepped on that path of like, oh my goodness, Brenda's going down the devil path. We have to save her soul. And my mom having a lot of sadness and anxiety around that. because She said, I know my mother's guiding you, so I know this is real, but I don't know what to say to them. And I remember telling her, you know, I'm asking grandma and she said, don't, don't argue with her. I said, I'm not angry with her. Uh, this is hundreds of years of indoctrination and, be, and being taught to be ashamed of the medicine of our ancestors. And uh, so I'm not angry at her. I said, I just want you to tell her three things. Brenda really loves you. She's really, really happy. And she would love to talk to you about this when you're ready. I said, and then just <laughs> let it go because this is between me and her, not you and her. And then, and when the thing my grandma said to me, when she said they're not ready yet to have this conversation and they will not be changed by any facts that you give them. They will be changed by being in ceremony with you. And I'll tell you when that's supposed to be. And, mm. and that's really when everything shifted. You know, she asked me to hold ceremony when my uncle died with them. Old mm. circle. And that just, you know, that's when everything shifted. She said, oh, this isn't evil. And I said, I know. <laughs> and your mom wants me to tell you that she's the one telling me to do this and that she taught you things too she taught you to take baths with the rosemary you know yeah so it's been really beautiful to like you said that process of retrieval and reclamation for ourselves but also for our families right um mm. to release some of that shame and indoctrination for sure yes yeah yeah i was going to invite you I know that we have some things we're excited to talk about tonight, but before we do, it feels always important because of our ancestors and the way our ancestors did things to invite you to lead us in a little prayer before we begin our conversation. I'd be honored to. Thank you so much, Brenda. And I like to start that way too, of course. So uh, maybe everybody can just take a breath with me.
And another one. And just one more. So I'll say, Wakantanka, uh, Tunkashara, Shimaka, Shama, Shache, Holy people all around. It's me, Wiakpa, Naji, we coming before you on this holy day. And I want to greet you. You know, I want, I, I, I ask that you take a look here at this gathering, this group that's come together um, to, to remember who we are and how we're all related, to remember right relations between all the nations. Um, to remember uh, right relations between the human beings and, and all of our other relatives, flying ones, swimming ones, creepy crawling ones, four-legged ones, standing nation, the trees, the stones, the waters, the mountains, this Mother Earth. And um, this Mother Earth, I invite you into this space and call upon you and, and say we make, we make a big space here for your input for your wisdom, for your guidance, for your direction through this conversation. And I want to call out to um, all, all of the allies in the cosmos, to this Mother Earth and to her um, authentic path and, and, and to her authority here and to her purpose and, and her path that she's moving you know, along and, and moving towards um, fulfilling uh, her uh, purpose and um and so i i ask that you help us the five-fingered ones you know find our place in that in all of those movements all of those many cycles some very small some very large but but we're here and and i trust and i and i feel that you know there's there's something there's things that only the human heart the human being can can offer to this to to all of the sacred movement and to this these path, this sacred pathway of this Mother Earth, the sacred pathway of light, life, and love. And so through this conversation, um, you know, I invite that which um, is in alignment with this Earth and the very highest possibility for life, light, and love to, to come into our midst through this conversation and to touch each one, to inspire each one, to uh, perhaps even doctor each one in whatever way is called for and needed at this very moment right here, right now. And, and let this conversation serve uh, the greater good and serve all those who you know, signed up to be here and who are not here, those in the, in the community, those in our own families, communities, and circles. Um, we open that pathway for, for your love and care, um, spirit, and holy people, Mother Earth, all the life to travel and to bless. And um, we, I receive your blessing and I ask for a good blessing on Brenda and all those involved here. Um, but let these, let these sounds be sacred medicine of our voices and the way that our, our thoughts are moving, you know, let those create pathways and, and send, send the ripples out to, to all uh, for joy, for health, for vitality, and um, just for, for peace also, please. So yeah, mm -hmm. let this time serve in as wide a way as you would have it be. Holy ones all around. So we talk we are awesome. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for grounding us in, in such a beautiful way as we step into these conversations. Mm. I am so grateful that I believe we met through bio and through We Will Dance With Mountains, but I'm trying to remember when we met. It feels like so long ago. And I instantly recognized a soul sister, of what I like to call companion of destiny, that we came here to be of service in a particular way in this particular time of shift and, you know, think a lot about things in terms of the Toltec calendar and how we're in time of shift between and what a gift and a privilege and responsibility it is to be in service to this time of shift. Um, I'm grateful for the ways that there's just these different threads that keep bringing us back together. Our relationship with Bio um, and Three Black Men, uh, our relationship with stewardship of land and the land calling us to sacred work right now. Um, I think I knew you and Lila June 
independently and didn't know that she was your daughter when I knew both of you. So it was really, when, when I found out, I was like, oh, that makes so much sense. <laughs> um, yeah, that makes so much sense. Yeah, it was a gift to be with her at Standing Rock. Um, so I'm just really grateful. And, and the other piece, I think, is that in different ways we've been, you know, holding space for the healing in, uh, of women, but also really in relationship, partnership with the healing of the sacred masculine too, in different threads in our lives. And so I, feel, I love how the spirit universe ancestors keep kind of weaving us together in these really beautiful ways. Um, yeah, I, I, I one of the things I wanted to share with folks on the call is you posted not long ago about um, a prayer that was uh, taken from a, a, a podcaster or an interview that you did some time ago. Would love for you to share a little bit about the mythic masculine interview you did, and and uh, yeah, what was important to you about that in terms of this relationship of land ancestral racial healing. Um, and you're in this particular thread that we have of wanting to heal men and women's nations. Uh, what's on your heart about that today? Hmm. Um, well, so the so the podcast series was called The Mythic Masculine. It was hosted by Ian McKenzie, who has since um, evolved uh, in many ways out of that out of that podcast. Um, uh, so keep if you look him up, uh, you'll you'll see a lot of different things going on and coming up. Um, but, uh, in that series, I think my, my, my part is, is, is the part is number seven in that. Um, but we had something very powerful happen in that podcast. Uh, well, one, I, I opened with a prayer, but then I also, uh, Ian asked me to speak to the men directly. And so I, so I made a prayer, a prayer for all men. And, um, you know, part of my process, um, for myself was one, you know, as I looked, so I, I look, I look at the, um, I, I didn't say I was adopted into the Lakota spiritual way of life. And so I kind of look at this more from that, that lineage, which is the sacred medicine hoop. And, and on that, you know, the way I look at it is um, some people call it the, the medicine wheel. Right. Um, but as I look at it, there was a, there was, I had a vision and, and it, 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 what came to me about it was that every single life form gets to have a seat on that sacred hoop. And, mm. and including the human being. And so every single form of life is contributing, not only for their own life, but for the integrity of the whole hoop. So if any member um, doesn't uphold their part or is prevented from holding up their part, then the integrity of the hoop begins to change. It begins to fail, actually. And so, mm. um, so as I looked at that, I thought, well, I think the human beings are the ones who are very confused about that re that responsibility or that, I don't know, responsibility always is, is heavy, but I'm going to say opportunity <laughs> because I think yeah. it's such a joyful thing to contribute to the health and well-being of community. And, you know, I think we all, we all, we, we don't have any trouble loving the diversity of animals around us. We find them fascinating and comforting and, and uh, beautiful. So yeah. to contribute to their well-being is, is kind of a, an easy thing on the heart and mind. Um, so I'll say the opportunity to uphold that hoop. Um, but we're confused about that. So I started saying to myself, well, so every member then has a perfect way to uphold their part of the hoop, or I say a perfect design for thriving life. And so the human being, my, my conclusion then is, since we've been given a seat there, we must also have a perfect design for thriving life. And so, but do we know what it is? How much do we remember about that? So there are different cultures. We tend to call them indigenous cultures who still have a uh, memory of what we might call original instructions, or we might call an understanding of that perfect design for thriving life, right? And so mm -hmm. I said, so I began to say, what do I know about my perfect design for thriving life? So there's a lot of different places I could look at that, but I chose to ask myself, so what does it mean that I came here as the female of our kind Mm -hmm. And what specifically about that being the female five fingered one? That's how I identify. Um, what is my contribution to this hoop? What is what's specific about that? 
So that's really mm-hmm. where my work around gender began was in that inquiry. And then from there, of course, once I start thinking about that, then I begin to think, well, and what what are the other genders? What is what is their specific role in upholding our part of the sacred hoop and and thinking about the masculine? Um, mm-hmm. So, um, from that perspective, I began to look at you know what. When I look at the characteristics, and here, you know, uh, it's a little bit always these days. It's it's hard to uh, to name what I think those characteristics are, but I'll just say this is this is from my view, and um, and I know there's a lot of other ways, lots of different ways to look at it, and and every every gender has a spectrum of Mm -hmm. of the energetics of masculine and feminine, and and I'll say queer as well, right? So, um, but but as I looked at sacred masculine, one of the things that came up for me that I found was very powerful. So for myself, for instance, I'll start with the feminine. The fact that I have that I, I consider my moon time uh, years were so powerful, and I felt like, wow, one of the things it feels like that I am to contribute here is I'm to be a dreamer for the people every month. Like I can mm. naturally fall into dream. I can naturally um, inquire um, from Earth and ask for instruction, ask for nurturing and nourishment. And boy, that just flows, right? And so from that place, I'm able to bring instruction and vision like directly from the earth into community about different things that we we might want to know. So for instance, that's my biology there is is informing my spiritual capacity and my my ability to to serve on this uh, sacred hoop of life. So one of the things that I looked at when I was looking at the masculine, I was like, well, uh, something that seems, <laughs> I never can get around this pun, that very prominent around <laughs> the sacred masculine is, um, is, uh, is their eros. That's mm-hmm. something that we associate very deeply with the masculine. Although I will, now that I'm in my elder womanhood, I'm like, well, I don't know, you know, there's things to consider there all the <laughs> way around. But anyway, um, but any, in any case, so, so I've been, so I, it, it just occurs to me, like, <clears throat> there's something very holy and very sacred about the masculine eros. And right now they're being so persecuted about that, or, you know, it's, it's I think it's, it's kind of shifting just a little bit recently, but, but there was definitely a period, certainly with, um, Me Too coming, uh, coming in. And, um, and so, you know, I began to speak out loud that I, I know that there is a way for community to celebrate the masculine eros just as much mm-hmm. as we celebrate a woman when she becomes pregnant or when she gives birth. Um, like there has to be a way to hold that, that masculine eros. And, and the more I began to speak about that, the more I felt the men opening to, okay, now I feel like I could I have a, a possibility of belonging, <laughs> yeah. you know? So, mm-hmm. so this is part of what I was speaking about in that, in that interview with with Ian and and other parts of just really coming into kind of a, a radical acceptance of of these aspects of masculine and saying so so one other thing I'll say before I come up come up for air and and and, and open that <laughs> space for you Brenda this is a big subject for me but one of the other things that came up that seemed really foundational for me is um, in ceremony you know I was asking what do we mean when we say masculine what do we mean when we say feminine. Um, mm-hmm. Like, like there's those, the, those words are so loaded by current paradigm Mm -hmm. and really paradigm for, I don't know, a few thousand years, I would say, but, but, (laughs) you know, we've been around longer than that. And so, you know, what do we mean when we're talking about the, the essence of these energetics, you know? And so what the answer came back in ceremony was, that's right. You think, you know, what masculine is, but you don't. And you think, you know, what feminine is, but you don't. All you know is how those energetics behave in this power over paradigm, this modern world paradigm. But if you were to plug them into a different paradigm, they would behave mm-hmm. in a completely different way. Yes. And that really began to change everything for me. And so that's where I began to refer to indigenous practices around gender and realizing, oh, so we have these systems. So one, you can mm-hmm. go into a ceremony and say, all the men over here, all the women over there, and I'll say in that in that in that in that culture, it's not a leaving out of the rest of the spectrum of genders, but it's allowing it's understood that that everybody else gets to place themselves where they want, uh, given <laughs> the, the feminine extremes 
of side of the spectrum is going to be over here and the and the masculine over there. And then there's this place over here where you can place yourself. So it's not really leaving it out. And it's just, um, it's not always referred to though, but you can actually say that in an indigenous ceremony and not have everybody be in an uproar because there's an understanding that there are specific roles that those who claim those genders can play to bring a ceremony into its full power, for instance. So anyway, I'll stop there. But that's um, that's where a lot of, of what I spoke about in that interview came from. Yeah, you know, I re-listened to it when you posted that prayer. And actually, I was at a, a gathering at Sunrise Ceremony um, recently, too, and there was a young man who came who was just in a deeply emotional state as the women were making offerings on the land. And I... And I Spirit told me to cue up your two minute prayer for all men and to just leave my phone at his feet playing. Um, and I know it impacted him. Um, so thank you. I'm so grateful uh-huh. that I re listened to that podcast and that prayer just days before that. And I felt that mm-hmm. spirit and ancestors were guiding that. Um, I relate to so much what you're saying because. You know, I certainly have had this journey as a uh, as someone who's in this body, in this skin, and you know why I came in this way in this lifetime, right? Um, I know that I had a lot of like uh, stuff around patriarchy when I was a kid, and it's kind of the norms that my mother and father were raised in Nicaragua. So many beautiful they taught things they taught me about our culture, and then also these other pieces that I found really difficult as a child and didn't agree with. I knew in my body, in my spirit, that I didn't agree with, you know, some of the patriarchal disrespectful pieces of that. And I think I had a journey of, like, of being in the kind of that angry feminist, uh, you know, rage when I was younger. And if that's what it means to be married, I'm never going to be married, you know, and all these things. Um, but then I remember spirit and ancestors asking me to start a women's moon circle and to start healing my sacred feminine and to do that in the circle of other women and to remember how women used to gather and, and be in ceremony together with the moon. And it's something just changed in me over those years in healing, healing those wounds, healing a lot of the ancestral trauma that lives in my body from those wounds and being able to see my parents in a really different light and, and understanding that they have their own, the own trauma that was passed down. And then what was interesting is I started to heal the sacred feminine within me. Uh, so many messages started coming through. If you came here with certain purpose in and, and this time, and you have to heal your relationship to the sacred masculine inside of you and mm-hmm. outside of you, because mm-hmm. you will not fulfill your purpose if you don't. You'll either, yeah, in that paradigm that you're talking about in the power over paradigm, what I was told is you have to heal a lot of this ancestral patterning around the power over paradigm that has been passed down and, and is part of the trauma in your body. Because otherwise you will either hold power in ways that were passed down that way in oppressive ways that are not in alignment with who you are, or you'll give your power away as so many of your ancestors did and made themselves small in order to survive the conditions they were in. Um, but as you heal, these things in you, you'll begin to hold power in a new paradigm way, which create when holding your power in such a way that you create the field around you and in, in which others are invited and welcome to pick up their stuff of power alongside you. Mm. Not over, not, it's not the, the duality of the fifth son, but the being in circle and all of us being in power, right. Um, mm. and, and in our gifts. And, you know, and I've heard that in different environments that I've worked in too, just, Men say, you know, being called into a lot of boys and men of color work when I was at Movement Strategy Center and uh, the California Endowment and so many other people and wanting to bring in the men who do the sacred masculine work, the healing work, the rites of passage work, um, knowing that that was just as much needed so that the, so that we can be, as you said, kind of holding our piece of the hoop the, uh, with integrity and, and being in right relationship with each other. So I've been really grateful for those things um i want to switch us to talking about two things that i think are really important to us one is we both were invited by our beloved victoria santos to um to participate as part of the ceremonial team with three black men um for those of you who who weren't connected to three black men it's uh 
two dear friends that I love very much, uh, Bayo Akomolafe, Orlin Bishop, uh, are folks that I love and have been in ceremony with in the past. And a new friend to the circle whose work I, I had read prior to this, Resma Menachem. Um, I'm very grateful for these three men and the sacred work they're holding in the world and how Victoria had this calling to bring them together and how they brought forth this vision of what they were supposed to do to trace uh, the diasporic passage, you know, in L.A., in Brazil, and soon in Ghana in, within another week or two. Um, because I love these men, because I know who, how they show up in the world and how they walk with their ancestors in different ways. Um, it was an easy yes for me when I found out that I said, I know I have to be there and support in whatever way I can. So I'm curious for you, uh, how you entered into the three black men and, and what called you there um, and mm. to say yes to this invitation. Mm. Thank you. Uh, well, I'm going to back up a little ways and say that uh, I was in several gatherings um, and, and, I'll, and I'm going to pick on the Bay Area. <laughs> <laughs> that's good <laughs> uh, uh, because it, it happened there a few times in a row at gatherings I was at mm -hmm. and I was like wow this is wild so there was mm -hmm. you know as, as we began to talk about um, the story of this nation the history uh, the lay of the land you know what I would find myself I'd be in different uh groups and different gatherings where the conversation was really about, you know, you know, how can, how can we move forward without acknowledging what took place during slavery? Um, anyway, and so the conversation would go on and on and, and, and it would, it would be, it would strike me as though the real origin place to talk about the founding of this nation was with slavery. And I'd be sitting there, right. And eventually I'd have to be like, um, Excuse me, but there's another place that we <laughs> that we need to look also, which was the extermination and gen attempted genocide on indigenous peoples of this continent. Mm -hmm. You know, this, that, that staggering figure of like 90% of the population being exterminated on this continent. And so yeah. um, I found it was really interesting because it felt really inconvenient to that conversation between white and black. Mm -hmm. to have to like I was like throwing this monkey wrench into the situation <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and, and there was some resentment around it too you know and I was like this just is so wild to me that that this could that this dynamic could happen and be this way especially mm -hmm. you know anyway so so that um was very provoking for me for a little while and I thought wow um I, I just had no idea that 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 mindset was was there so um so something about that i feel like kind of drew energetic attention to me and then i started getting invited to speak um with um african-american and black uh people about you know what what happens when we bring our voices together to speak about the situation right and honestly, I felt, and I still feel this way. So, if you do invite me to do that, just know this is <laughs> this is how it seems. To me. I'm not quite sure exactly what I want to say, um, except that I know it's very significant that we're in this in this position together in this nation. And mm -hmm. um, and then I went to Africa and I started being with um, some African sisters and start getting to experience their, their way. Because in the United States, I was meeting Black people who were saying, I, I have no connection to our ceremonies and our songs and our ways. And so that was what I knew here. But then when I went to Africa, of course, there were still threads moving and people who were moving with the ceremonies and the songs. And so I thought, okay. So now I get to experience what that feels like. And then really, mm -hmm. and then really coming back to this nation and really feeling that loss. I mean, I knew it intellectually, but to mm -hmm. kind of get the somatics of it and be like, oh, yeah. oh, so what do you do when you just like get, get grabbed and, and put somewhere else? And, you know, and so um, so I'll just say that that was sort of the background, the backdrop and the origins. So then I meet mm -hmm. so then I meet Orland Bishop. Right. Mm -hmm. And Orland 
is it's like Orlin the Oracle. Orlin is an oracle on Earth. Yes. And the the depth of his listening and his spiritual connection and and the wisdom that he's able to bring forth that just inspires so much. I mean, you know, yes. I can try to quote Orlin, but I don't feel like I'm ever actually quoting him. I can only describe what happens after he spoke, like what came through me, yeah. <laughs> you know? Mm-hmm. And so I was just like, wow, this is really a force. And then I meet Bio Komalafe and, and similar, right? Like there's just yes. this, very it's similar sort of like experience. beyond consciousness in a way. It's, it's just mm-hmm. below what consciousness can solidify. And mm-hmm. it tickles and it teases and it's it's a little uncomfortable, honestly. And Bio knows this about me, but I'm like, you know, <laughs> Bio in particular likes to just pull the any solid ground out from under your feet. He he's not he, he's restless that way, it seems to me. And that's hard for me because what I feel like my work is I'm always trying to offer handholds and footholds for people to just be like, this is something you might count on, you know. <laughs> and here comes Bio, and he's like, "Well, I don't know." Can you? You know? <laughs> and so we kind of do this dance and go back and forth. But but just the level of of the wisdom, you know. And so this is just mm-hmm. very direct experience. And so I just thought, wow. Um, and then I heard Orlin say something again. I can't quote Orlin, but this is what happened when Orlin said something <laughs> for me. And he's. It sounded like what he was saying was, you know the 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 black experience in this country this nation this superimposed nation state on this indigenous continent um is very is is very has has been all part of the plan it's very intentional to have these people with the depth of connection to earth depth of their song and their ceremony be severed from it but yeah, still yeah. be these vessels. And these vessels are to open up this passageway into the future. Mm. And so I thought, wow, okay. Um, I want to support that. I want to support yeah. that. And so, you know, especially these two men really felt like they they exemplified that for me. And then, of course, I also met Resma later. And um, get, mm-hmm. getting to know him and his work. And so, you know, when I was invited to this, you know, the honoring of, so it's three Black men, but it's really about honoring Blackness in general. But then mm-hmm. also, so, you know, Victoria had been working with with Black women for a, a while. But mm-hmm. then she got the nudge and she, you know, maybe similar to us. But what about the black yeah. men? What happens when we support them? What happens when we uplift them? What happens when we really love and honor them? What can happen for us? You know, and I, I really felt that. I really, really felt that. So when I got invited and then and then so here's here's also a feminine holding for me was, you know, Victoria. Immediately upon thinking about this event, sets up a ceremonial. uh council or practitioner you know like how can we have this gathering without the ceremonial practitioner so I I love that to me that was a very feminine leadership kind of movement right and um and then so we got called in to do it and I and I love how it happened because there wasn't a prescribed anything it was just you know you women praying and and so we know that you're going to pray and you're going to it's going to come to you how to hold this container. And so how powerful was that to that also another very feminine way of, of not having to have a prescription, but to be in the moment, to be in the heart, to be in the intuition and listen and move from that place. So that, that was extraordinary for me with this work. Yeah, it was extraordinary for me too. And there's so many layers, I think of some of the things we were talking about, uh, earlier you know just this dance between all the beings in the hoop and all the love and the uplifting of everyone in the hoop and and i hear you know how victoria is bringing this vessel together to open these energetic portals then you know that i felt an energetic portal opened in a way when we were there um and to have the men you know held by this group of ceremonial women and then similarly you and i have been talking about how the land has been calling us to steward it and calling us in, in particular ways to 
bring kind of this ancestral and land healing and, and this reconstitution of the hoop that you're talking about in these places that were all related. So I'm curious for you, how, how is, uh, as, as I'm being called to a lot of work around ancestral racial land healing, I don't see those as disconnected, they're all connected. Um, how is the land calling you? How are these questions of uh, the relationship of female leadership and the men that are showing up um, in that space? Um, what's that been looking like for you? And what's important about that as kind of the healthy masculine, the healthy feminine, and it's this new time that we're entering into, this time of the sick sun, you know, it's known by so many different names and so many cultures. What what are you seeing out there as this sacred relationship with land and with each other? Hmm. Well, I'm trying to remember where we were. What were we doing? Um, but I, I, I have this memory of us sitting on a bus together seemed like, mm -hmm. and I don't remember where we were going or with who, but I remember us, and that was where you were first beginning to talk about taking on stewardship of some land, kind of somewhere in the LA area, right, and and I was talking about, it kind of looked like this, this thing was, this storm was brewing on the horizon for me about a similar thing, uh, only I, at that point I had not fully open to it or, or I didn't feel like I didn't feel like I had said yes but maybe apparently I had said no <laughs> because <laughs> ultimately, <laughs> ultimately it came to pass and so 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 even just thinking about this land back movement um mm -hmm. for those of you who uh, may not know that term it's talking about returning land back to the a stewardship of the original peoples. Um, and so those tend to be indigenous mm -hmm. peoples, right? And to their, um, because we've been removed from our lands um, or our territories have been greatly reduced or, or, or so like that. And so there's, there's, a, there's an idea that if we could return the lands to the original stewards who had come to have such deep um, synergistic, I'll say, uh, relationship to land where where the land uh, brought us into health and vitality and right relations with each other with ourselves with with the whole hoop of life and then we also contributed to that land's well-being and and it just kept spiraling and growing and, and in place for you know not just a thousand years sometimes but five thousand years ten thousand years twenty thousand years so that's a that's a profound marriage <laughs> to land yeah. right and multi-generational um so the idea is being that you know if we could return those lands to indigenous stewardship uh that might be a good idea and 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 it is but not in all instances because things have changed a lot so I'll just i just feel like i have to say that so so we have to you know we have to have discernment there all the way around, but um, but in any case, so I I came into this position of now um, stewarding 140 acres of land at the base of one of our four sacred mountains, so that's more land than I've ever considered um, trying mm -hmm. to be accountable for, and uh, mm -hmm. it's pretty daunting, honestly, it's quite daunting, but um, but just the way that that came about. Um, you know, it was it was it happened through young people's prayers and their concerns for our people's future. Um, and so they said, we're going to go and consult with our, the original elders who gave us our original teachings, which are the four sacred mountains. And that's kind of what set this whole thing in motion. And so the owners of this land said, uh, gosh, it's turning out that we're not going to be able to stay here, but wouldn't it be great if indigenous people could hold it? And so I'm naming this process a little bit, because to me, I, I, I call this a feminine, a feminine process. So it's highly relational, and that doesn't mean it's women's. It just means it's feminine, right? Okay, so let's make that distinction. Mm -hmm. But um, so, you know, when I talked to the owners of the land, they were like, man, we always thought we would live and die here. And I said, well, you could, you know, why don't you just stay? Because I, I feel like I'm probably, this is going to be a multi-generational endeavor. And I think I'm going to end up being here, and I'm going to have to have young people take care of me. So maybe you can just stay, you know, because they were non-Indigenous people. And just grow old here anyway, you know, and we'll, but we'll still make this primarily a place where my, my people, indigenous, my, well, I'll just say my people, Diné people will have ceremonial access to the mountain. Mm -hmm. So that, you know, that way of coming into this 
um, negotiation and transfer of stewardship felt highly relational, open to many possibilities. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, um, and then the way that, you know, I asked for it to be done was I said, I, I want this to be done in every way possible in ways that has never been done before. So we can begin to expand and break down all these legal structures and financial structures as much as possible because they are not designed for cooperation and collaboration. They're designed for protection and hoarding, mm-hmm. <laughs> basically. Yeah. And, and that's not what this movement is. So, so that's one of the big differences I feel like with these, these, some of these land back uh, movements is, is there's, there's a, they're, again, deeply relational, but um, mm-hmm. so ultimately, and then the people who contributed to the purchase of this land, you know, they, they said, you know, my ancestors, um, gained their wealth in this superimposition of this nation state upon this indigenous continent by uh, land theft, oil and timber sales. Mm -hmm. And that does not feel right to me. So, you know, and and these people, we've been in relationship for a while and these people had done a lot of ancestral healing work. And so they said, you know, so this feels correct for us to, to bring our wealth back to a situation like this. Mm -hmm, Um, mm -hmm. so that was very powerful. And that was actually a matriarch of the family and a, and one generation younger who decided both women who decided they wanted to to do that. So those were the two of the primary contributors to this. Um, so, so I'm, so I had to step, I had to step back and say, cause I I hadn't been thinking, I mean, I, I support land back. It's a great idea, but I hadn't really seen myself involved in it. So I get called in by spirit. Mm-hmm. And that to mm-hmm. me is a, is a very deep practice of saying, you know, because I have said to spirit, I'm, I make myself available to you. And so yeah. wasn't planning on this, but here it comes. So this is a kind of submission to an authority, to a loving, life-giving authority where I say yes, you know. And so mm-hmm. that's important because when it came down to the, to the structure of how to hold the land, um, that was a big debate for me. And I was like, mm-hmm. so I thought, you know, uh, it seems like the, the, the communal egalitarian way to do that would be to have a nonprofit hold it. I mean, none of the structures are good for this. Let's just say, yeah. again, they're not designed <laughs> for this kind of relational thing, but, yeah. but a nonprofit. Um, so the, dip, the, as some of you probably know, the difficulty with nonprofits is, is that they can, they can be wrested away from the original ideas and the original holders. Yes. Um, and, and they just, you know, you can get kicked out at a certain point. And so I really had this sense that, honestly, the medicine men of my people might mm-hmm. not want to go through this process of listening and waiting and trying to understand what the mountain mm-hmm. was asking for, what the water was yes. asking for, yes. what, 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 how was this really going to be medicine for our people going forward? I really mm-hmm. felt like a lot of the medicine men that, because my daughter had tried to get medicine men to come out to to bless the Hogan, the ceremonial house, and they all wanted thousands of dollars to come and do that for the young people. Mm-hmm. And so that told me something about where their minds and hearts were at, right? Yeah, and so I was yeah. like, I was like, um, no, I can't, I can't, I don't see that. So until we get mm-hmm. the community together around. This is medicine that is given to us for to find the way forward, not to keep living what we've been living and and the lateral violence, the mm-hmm. the the economics of you know the remnants of attempted genocide and and that mad scrap scramble for scraps um, kind of mentality. Like we need to have a different way. So. So that, that mm-hmm. was one place where this where this masculine and feminine dynamic came in. And the two people who showed up first, well, no, the very first person to show up to help me be a caretaker up there um, was a young woman. And she was had a deep, deep spiritual practice. It was, felt so great to have her there. Mm-hmm. And then the next two who came were two men who really, they're both healers and they're both really wanting to, to just in their whole lives, bring a different masculine presence other than what their fathers had done, their grandfathers, the pa- what we call mm-hmm. the patriarchy. Um, and they really wanted to bring a different presence. And so they were the first ones to show up. And I thought that was very significant. I thought this is going to be a place where the masculine has an opportunity to reinvent mm-hmm. themselves. And I'll say one last thing, which is just that, um, you know, I, 
I feel that the sacred feminine has has many places to explore what that means with each other. Many groups, women's groups, the goddess movement, all kinds of things. But I'm going to say sacred masculine has not had that as much. Yeah. They're starting to. They're starting to be more and more. But I'm going to say, you know, we we do not know what the sacred masculine could give us at this point. We have not seen that medicine on the earth for thousands of years. I think not not in not in a in a large way. And so I say, man, what is going to happen when the sacred masculine arrives? I, I think it's going to be extraordinary. And so I don't know. I feel like these these new configurations of land stewardship are huge opportunities for that medicine to to come forward. And these men, you know, they say we are in service to you. So one, they're they're willing to be in service to feminine leadership, but really what they're what we all agreed is it's not so much about me, it's about the fact that I know that I have to submit to what the land says. <laughs> And that's what we're all in service to. So it's not hierarchical at all. Yeah. 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 So, you know, I think I've shared some of the story with you of the land that's been calling me here up in Northern California. Uh, And I've been in a relationship with this land for many years now with my women's circle. And the land has said, I don't, well, you're not supposed, I need you to steward. Um, And I remember making offerings on the land and saying, my promise to you is that I'll always listen and be obedient and be in co-creation with you. And they said, that's why it has to be you, because you're not in a place of dominion, whether it's a good cause or bad cause, that you're listening and you're in service to, you know. And they said, but it's not time for, you know, for you to buy or be gifted this land yet. The land has been a rock quarry for over 100 years and, and said, I need healing from all that has happened to me on the land for so long and I need you uh, to work with your women's circle to do some of that healing of all the heavy karma and heavy energy on the land so we've been very obedient and doing that and I remember the land also telling me early on like yeah, your husband has to prepare uh, because he needs to be the man that can be on the land with you and you understand that it's land you're, you'll steward with community um, and, but not that you own personally and he needs to prepare for that, you know, because he was raised in a different paradigm, right? Um, and we had, the land asked us for a particular ceremony just this past February with the Women's Circle and with people who are close to that lifting up of listening to the land and wanting to help create it. And I remember my husband saying, I've been watching Brenda at the beginning. I thought, oh, we got to get the land. You got to fundraise. You're going to lose it to somebody else. And she said, no, this is not on, this is on spirit time and on the, and the land's time, not my time and not your time. You know, and, and he's been part of these ceremonies. He's gotten to know the women's circle and the men connected the women in the men's circle. And there's been healing in that. And he's been healing by, you know, working with the earth in our backyard and doing his own spiritual work and healing. And in that ceremony, years later, you know, just this past February, he said, I get it now. I didn't get it before, but I get it now. He said, I, 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 yeah, I can't wait to retire and to be in service, you know, he's a carpenter at the Oakland Zoo, so he's a builder. And he said, I can't wait to retire and to be on the land with the women's circle and to be a man who's building and creating in service to what the women in the land say the land wants, you know, like to be in service. When you said those words, the men who are arriving are in, interested in serving the land and in service to the feminine leadership on the land. He's in that place now. And I remember when he started saying those things in our ceremony, it was the ceremony to release the dragon energies that have been repressed on that land. And, and those energies, those land guardian energies that want to help us get the land. And um, when he said those things, I just wanted to cry. I could feel the joy of the earth of the sacred masculine who says, I want to be in service with the women say the land is telling them at once. Um, and I was like, he's ready. He's finally ready, you know? Uh, so yes, I, I really feel what you're saying, um, about this time. And, and for me again, like going back to this connection, the weaving of the ancestral, the racial, the land healing, it's all connected and it's going to happen. You know, the land wants healing ceremonies. It wants circle space for men and for women. It wants uh, rites of passage. It wants, ceremonies where we're doing our healing griefs and work together across the different colors of the medicine hook, you know, um, there's so much that the land wants in this time and it, and it wants us to, to come back into relationship. There was a really interesting quote, um, 
I read read recently from Rowan um, Rowan White about like the the struggle with the land back terminology sometimes because and that I prefer the word rematriation. I remember Rowan saying I prefer the word rematriation to land back because I want to get out of those system old systems of of control and ownership of the land, right? And and this new paradigm that you're talking about uh, that feels really really important. I'm going to just remind folks, I'm, I'm going to keep talking, but I also just want to remind folks if there's any questions you have for Pat or myself to feel free to put those into the chat. Um, yeah, I, the other thing I want to say, because I think it relates to something you were saying earlier. I was just thinking about how, you know, I knew Orland, I feel the same way that you do about Orland Bio, they're just special magical beings. The rest I didn't know, but I knew of his book because... Um, I remember I kept teaching a lot about indigenous prophecy and teachings and, and, you know, things that my elders and teachers had taught me and, and the importance of ancestral healing in this time, you know, and I remember people kept saying, it sounds like you're saying what, from an indigenous perspective, what Resma Menachem is saying in his book, my grandmother's hands. And within a week or two, two or three people said that to me in, in different ways. And it's like, I have to pick up this book. Uh, and then I just fell in love with the work he was doing. Um, so when I hadn't met him at that point, but when I found out about Three Black Men, I was just so excited about this possibility. And I do think there's something about what you were saying early on about just the particularity of kind of Blackness in the U.S., because I saw that a little bit in, even as we were planning and in the ceremonies when Resmo was having his feet washed by Bio and um, Orland. <laughs> oh, that was, for me, that was one of the most magical parts of the whole journey together was seeing my brothers wash his Resmo's feet. And also just what he was going through in that process of, of surrendering to that. But I, it occurred to me Orland and Baya were not born here, so they have a very different frame of masculinity. Uh, yes. Not to know, not to mean that there wasn't oppression there, but I think they both come from cultures where men are affectionate with each other, and men can show each other love, and that's not dangerous there in the same way that it is here, right? And how much mm -hmm. that ties into the colonial programming and mindset, and and to see those walls broken down, even in Rasmus' discomfort, that receiving from his brothers and then saying, oh, I see why we need to do this at the men's gathering now, now that he's experienced it, right? Um, you said something, I don't know if you remember. I remember Resma processing just what that thing was for him. And he asked in the, in the, the, the team of us that were helping to put on the thing that witnessed that and that were singing as it was happening. That was so beautiful too. And our brother, Aaron Johnson was leading us in song and holding that container with him. The whole thing was, oh. but I remember Resma asking, what was that like for all of you? And one of the things that I remember you saying was watching you as men, watching the two, these two brothers washing your feet healed something in me as women's nation. And I was crying the whole time you were saying that because I felt that too. Um, so I'm curious if there's anything on your heart about why this work across race and across gender and, and with the land is so important and it's time for healing. It's not just about individual healing. It's so much bigger than that. So I'm wondering if you have any, any thoughts on that. Um, well, yeah, that was such a powerful moment and that tenderness. And for me, one of the things that carried over from that moment um, <clears throat> of the tenderness of men, men attending to another man and his feet, you know, because that can be seen as like a submission of sorts, I guess. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. And, and so getting out of the, the egoic part of aspect of masculinity um and, and and watching that 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 breakthrough with resma and, and and that tenderness and so for me that was rep that medicine was represented when we laid down rose petals for the black men to enter into the space yes. to me that's what that those rose petals represented was exactly that and just thinking about you know it was like 
what, 40 plus men coming in barefoot, walking on those rose petals. And I just thought, ah, oh. but, <clears throat> but, you know, what, for me, um, I think I said it in that gathering too. Uh, but for me, you know, I, watching the mistreatment of black people, watching the mistreatment of black men all my life, even though I had not been much of an activist around that for the majority of my life, only until very recently. Um, but, but I didn't know how much when we witness that with each other, even if we don't get involved, we carry that wound. That's what I learned. Mm-hmm. And I didn't even know I was carrying that wound. And it's, it's a kind of, it's, it's a, it's, it's a quote microaggression trauma that builds and builds and builds like we're not we're we're actually such incredibly sensitive instruments that spirit i mean i mean everything on this earth is that way and we are no exception we are so sensitively tuned our sensitivity but you wouldn't know it by looking around the world right now but but that doesn't mean it's not true and Mm -hmm. so um i didn't know that i'd been carrying this Sense this sense of being bereft and grief stricken at at watching the the microaggressions and the not so microaggressions towards my black relations until we did that gathering, and I mm-hmm. and so I just had to say there is something here, like it's healing something in me because I didn't even know I was carrying that, but the fact that we're going to do this on behalf of, I mean to me. The fact that it was black men was like, and and some women disagreed with me on this, but I just felt like that gets to the heart of the the aggression towards towards blackness. Um, but but that that was just so powerful for me to to know that we were all going to come together and support that, and mm-hmm. and heal this place in me that I didn't even know was was raw and bleeding and. Mm-hmm. And and terrorized by witnessing, yeah. you know. So, <clears throat> so I think when we do come together in these across whatever imaginary <laughs> divides, um, yeah. that that takes place. That takes place. Mm-hmm. And what I'm learning, so I'm I'm deep. I'm 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 more than elbow deep. I'm kind of like eyeball deep in trauma release and healing right now. And I'm just. You know, the more that I turn towards the stuff that I was not prepared to face and release and feel all the feelings, because it feels like those feelings are going to annihilate you. Every mm-hmm. single time it feels like if I turn towards that, I'm going to get annihilated. My brain tells me that, right? But I've been learning how to tell my brain, I know, but we're going to do it anyway. And then you go mm-hmm. in and you do it. And then the entire vista changes. All the possibilities, the realm of possibilities change. Every single time I go in and do that release. And so imagine what happens when we do that communally. Imagine what that happens when we do that ceremonially. Um, you know, our whole vista of the world is going to change with those actions. Yes. Yes. Yeah. 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 Yeah, um, I wanted to note that Adeli had wanted to know any recommendations on readings or podcasts regarding the old power over paradigm and new models for that matter. I, I put a link to some things um, on my webpage that are about, at least the way I talk about it is certainly from uh, the Toltec teachers I've been connected to and this time a paradigm to the fifth to the sixth sun. And um, that we're ending the time of the fifth sun, which is very much the paradigm of power over, of war, of separation between genders, of racism, of sexism, um, and then when we're looking for the solutions outside and the time of the six on that, we're just at the cusp of beginning is what we call the white sun and the time of, of reclaiming our Quetzalcoatl nature is how we talk about it in the Toltec. Mm-hmm. But I love that Sergio is very clear. He said, don't get fundamentalist about any of it. What we call <laughs> Quetzalcoatl nature is the Christ consciousness, is the Buddha consciousness, is the unity consciousness. Um, you know, it's the coming back into the medicine hoop and and the things that you're talking about. Um, and that's that's one of the things I think that I've been really grateful for. I'm in a lot of 
intermystic circles across traditions, which is really different from interreligious interfaith circles that are made more here in the theology. The ones that kind of drop in and listen in the way that you're talking about listening, land, asking what it wants, you know, the mystics are, are the ones that just drop in that way. And, and, um, and I feel really strongly that the mystics kind of the ones that watch the cosmos and listened, you know, we're all kind of in alignment. We might, our, our prophecies might vary a little bit, but we all know we're in some kind of shift, right? And that uh, this time is about clearing for our ancestors, clearing for future generations, healing in all these directions. Um, so as, as we're closing, I want to just make a special prayer and invite people to a little bit of practice. And I'm going to invite folks just to close their eyes because it feels important around clearing some things in the throat chakra. So I'm going to invite people to just take a deep breath in and out and to connect with the divine below, send their, your gratitude to Mother Earth and all the ways that she supports us and wants to partner and co-create with us and allow that energy to fill you up. That's coming from the divine below. And sending our also out through our crown, our gratitude to the cosmos, the galaxy, the creator, by all the names we know, creator, your higher self, whatever guides, spirit beings that walk with you, sending our gratitude in that direction for the fact that we're part, both uh, both as uh, a relative of Mother Earth, but we're also a relative, uh, galactic relative, a cosmic relative. Oh. So sending love and gratitude in that direction and receiving energy that way, knowing that we're both fully divine and fully human, and that those energies that support our intellect and our intuition in the time of the sixth sun are supposed to operate primarily from our heart and the integration of those energies of the sacred union within us, of the healthy masculine, the healthy feminine. So allow asking for that energy from above and below to come into us and fill us up so we can be the good relatives we need to be in this time. And feeling behind us the seven generations of ancestors that came before us, known and unknown, and all their beauty and gifts and all their trauma and difficulty, knowing that we wouldn't be here without them and that they carry many gifts that we're meant to access, but also trauma and healing that they're asking for help with. And then in, in the direction above, in front of us, the seven generations yet to come that we're responsible to that we're doing this healing work for so they can inherit the time of the sun in a different paradigm, different future, all centered in the heart above and below the past and future. And we give thanks to mother earth and we offer her much love and the best energy of our dreams, our thoughts, our feelings, our actions. And we ask her to clear from our throat, just to clear from, for anyone who's listening, Right now in live time, anyone who listens to the recording later, I humbly respectfully ask Mother Earth that we clear in the throat area for all of us who are coming here to serve in this time to first clear in our throat area the energy, the patterning of those ancestors in our line who held power in oppressive ways that caused harm with their power. And we also ask to clear from our throat area those ancestors who gave their power, staff of power away, made themselves small in order to survive the times that they were in. And not judging any of those ancestors, but knowing that we need to clear those patterns from within us so we're not carrying them forward. And also clearing heavy karma for those ancestors who did take up their staff of power and spoke their truth and were killed and harmed for doing so. We ask you, Mother Earth, to take this heaviness and to take it to the earth to be composted so that it reverberates not just for our own healing, but also for the ancestors who came before and are carrying this heaviness in the ancestor world. We ask you to help clear this so that we can take up our staff of power in this time with integrity, with love, with sovereignty, and to take up our staff of power in such a way that we create a field around us in which it is safe for others to take up their staff of power alongside us to be in their gifts alongside us, to be in the leadership and the new paradigm of leadership in the time of the sixth sun. We ask for energy 
from a sacred above and below to, to be the best people we can be in this time, to take up our staff of power with will, with discipline, with integrity, with sovereignty, and to honor the staff of power, the sovereignty, the dignity of those around us so that we can take up our staffs of power together and it does not have to be an either or anymore. But that is the old way, the time of the fifth sun that's dying. We don't need to carry those patterns forward anymore. We give thanks to Mother Earth. We give thanks to the cosmos for whatever ways you support us in taking up our staff of power with, with integrity and truth and love in these times. Mm. And to model a new way of holding that power. Mm. With that, I clap my hands together and I say, oh, Mateo, in gratitude. So much that you shared, Pat, I just, I'm so grateful. As I feel like there's so many parallels in our journey. I remember when Spirit uh, called me up to do sunrise ceremony and said, these trees sit, called, came and said, you got to come up and do sunrise ceremony. And we have, um, well, thank you, Ed, for sharing that. Michael Mead, annual men's retreat at Mendocino. Orlin co-led the two years I went. Orlin's a magical being. I'm, I'm so grateful to have been in ceremony with him at different times. Um, at one time, I was uh, on a retreat with Jubilee Partners, and my friend Conda Mason had invited us to, it was a group of people of wealth and, and a group of spiritual wisdom keepers. And uh, Orlin was there. I was there. So many other beloveds were there. And I remember there was a home on the, it's, it's a former slave plantation, which is now an organic farm. And there's a, a home of formerly enslaved people that's still on the land, what some people might call a slave cabin. But I remember Angel Kyoto Loan saying, we have to be intentional with our, our language. And she said, it's the home of formerly enslaved people. They were not slaves. They were people who were enslaved. And, you know, we got called I got called to go and do ceremony and clearing and healing around that space. And we all went together. And I remember the ancestors called me to make offerings in the hearth in that home and then to invite everyone to help clear the space together. So I had bells it out, smudge bundles out. And, and I said, whatever energy magic you carry, prayer, whatever it is, singing, chanting, we'll all just walk around the house and offer all this blessing on this land that had, you know, a lot of suffering and, and it was interesting that the ancestors called me back to the hearth at the end of that. And they said, it's really important that you say to these people, uh, yes, a lot of suffering did happen in this home, but there was also a lot of joy and love and beauty and ceremony and song in this home. And then I remember Orland saying, as we were in the circle outside talking about our experience and what we felt as we were doing this together, he said, uh, the those beings that were here in this in this home that you know that we're talking to Brenda and they they said to him, "We dreamt you into being. We made you possible. In our time, it was inconceivable that there would be a circle of people here of all different races, all different genders, all different spiritual traditions, wealthy people and not wealthy people in ceremony together." And that was not that long ago, but it was our prayers at this hearth, our ceremonies our, that have prayed you into being. And you have to pray into being, being the next few generations, right, through the things that you do right now. And so mm. I, I know that this work is so sacred that we're involved in. Um, it's so important that we do this healing work, right? with ourselves, with each other, with the human, as well as the non-human realm and our beloved relatives. Mm. Mm. Any other things that, yep, that you want to share in, in the closing moments? And, and if anyone else has questions, please, please feel free to offer questions in the chat. Um, well, I think I want to, so, so I'm, you know, approaching this place that, that kind of, I ended up getting, I don't, I don't know that it had to be a terrorizing place, but it was for me <laughs> for all kinds mm -hmm. of reasons to, to be so young and to be sent across the country into a, a culture and a whole situation that, you know, I was, I'd never con considered anything like, you know, East coast prep school <laughs> before, and, and the competitiveness and the, and the pressure, the pressure to perform and to, 
um, you know, the, the kinds of greatness that was acknowledged and the kinds of greatnesses that were not acknowledged. And, you know, all of that um, was, was very, very hard to, on my soul, <laughs> I'm going to say. Um, and I got, I got, uh, I got overwhelmed, you know? And so as I was approaching this, this place yesterday, you know, my prayer came out about it, you know, saying, you know, I, I'm, I'm coming back. I didn't know if I'd ever come back, but, I, but anyway, here I am today. And, um, and I, and I just said, you know, I, I'm, I'm asking for healing. I'm asking for, um, truth. I'm asking for perspective. I'm asking for reconciling. Um, I, I want, I want my, but then this part came, it was just like, I want my whole mature adult self to acknowledge once and for all that I did not have to be made into something to be worthy. I did not have to be broken down and reforged to be received by this mother earth, to be a blessing mm. on this mother earth, to be cherished by creation and creator, if not other human beings. Right. And, um, and, and I also just was thinking, you know, uh, about the intact indigenous communities where, you know, we didn't look at the children and think, now, how, how do they need to be developed? And they're a little bit shy, so we need to work on that. And they're a little bit, you know, like, we didn't look at them that way. Instead, we looked at them with loving eyes to try to understand what was being gifted to us in them. Through them, yeah. Mm -hmm. Through them. Through their inherent nature through their inherent characteristics through their inherent you know idiosyncrasies their isms their you know and 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 after watching them be themselves allowing them to be themselves and watching them be themselves then a wise person would come and say okay i'm giving you this name so that we can all recognize what has come into our midst and i'm like wow you know what a what a a, a deep difference in, in that. Yeah. So I just it's 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 related to our subject, I suppose, and a little bit further uh, further away from what we've been talking about. But that's just what's so present for me today, doing this work. And I don't know. I guess really, that's the call. I guess for us looking at each other in general, right? Yes. Yeah. To to be curious and open to what the medicine. Each being in front of you carries, whether it's human or non-human, you know, I think it's so important. I remember reading, I think it was from Eladoma Sume about how in his particular culture that when a woman is pregnant, the, the, the woman goes to the council and they give her um, some medicine that allows her to go into a trance-like state and they begin to have a conversation with the baby while they're still in the womb. And they ask, what is your name supposed to be? What are you coming here to do? What are your gifts for the community? And so the community relates to that child that way. If they say they're coming to be an artist, then when they're born, artist materials are gifted to the family. And then as soon as they're walking and talking, they're apprenticing, shadowing, walking with the artist in the community because that's what they're coming here to do. And, and to me, again, that speaks to that curiosity uh, around what are the gifts rather than trying to impose the same school structure on everybody. Um, you know, and I remember Patricia St. Ange also talking about that in the Kalmakak in the old days in, in the Mayan, uh, some of the Mayan territories, they, if you saw a child with aptitude for astronomy, for agriculture, things like that, you would get sent to this particular academy, but you you would be tracked according to your gifts. Like, you know, the adults are watching for what your gifts and your interests and your aptitude is uh, and, and the gifts that you're bringing for the tribe, for the for the community, which feels like such a different way. The land that I've been talking to has said, when you get the land, you have to have circles for young people with spiritual gifts so that they are being supported uh, with their gifts, so that they're being mentored in their gifts, so that they're not losing or having them shut down, but also that they learn integrity with those gifts, right? Because it's a responsibility mm. to carry those things. Um, the other piece of that is, you know, as we're ending, so I remember said here saying that his elder, you know, Jorge had told him, anytime we go through one of these big transitions every 6,625 years, 
that there's a lot of death, there's a lot of natural disaster, and there's a lot of collapse of systems, which is to be expected because those systems were built in the consciousness of the last sun. And so, mm-hmm. you know, the what I the message I keep getting from Spirit in the Land is like the young ones being born right now are coming in with blueprints for the new systems and the new consciousness. So we yes. have to support that medicine and encourage that medicine and recreate the intergenerational lines that have been so lost in modern society. Um, yeah. Yeah. So I hear everything you're saying about just loving up on those young ones and, and allowing and loving up on our own to... young one. It's not too late to love up on your own young one. It's no, the other no. thing, right? Yeah. <laughs> I love that you were talk, texting me about that this morning that, you know, the loving up on our inner child and our inner young ones and the things that they went through. Um, I, when I, I have a friend named Mia Lee, he does incredible inner child journeys. And uh, when I went and did one, like my young one came through in that inner child journey and was just showing me so much about the gifts that, that, I, that I have to reclaim that I've shut down from that inner young one. Uh, and also, yeah, for sure, healing some of the wounds that that inner young one had about people having judgment or thing around things they said or did. But also saying, like, I'm not just here to be healed. I actually have things you need right now. Uh, and I want to play again. I want I want you to play and remember who you are. Like you, you were just comfortable in your body and in your dancing and, and, and you're bolder in ways that you've forgotten. So reclaim that part of your young one. Heal the parts that are wounded, but reclaim the parts of me that you need right now. And that's been really encouraging to me. So this is something that I say to young people when I work with them is I tell them, you came here to change it all. <laughs> okay. <laughs> like why else would you be coming right now? Because this situation really needs to change and it is changing. Yeah. Um, and so just have a little mercy on me as an elder to you, because I, you still need me um, to some degree, but, but, you know, imagine what it is to mentor an elder someone who came here to change everything that I know, not everything, but so much of what I know and the life I've led. Um, so it's, it's a, it's a pretty challenging place in a way for, for us elders and mentors to these young people. But, um, you know, I always, I often find that the best, best possible thing that I tell them, I mean, every time I say this to a group of teenagers, the, inevitably half of them cry. I always tell them, do you know your joy matters? Your joy matters. Do you know that? Like your joy is your compass. I said, and I didn't have a single adult ever tell me your joy matters. And I think it was because they felt they were, they were afraid because of the current system and and the school systems and the, all the institutions and everything. They were like, you know, there's really not going to be that much joy. So let's just don't talk about it. Um, Which is these are our most precious young people and we don't want to talk to them about joy. Are you kidding me? It's like, no. So, you know, I always tell them that and I always tell the adults around and myself, I'm like, you know, how can we ask them to want their life if we don't, we're not sure we want our life. So that means we have to be able to, you know, we have to tap into our joy as well in order to actually bring in this generation that's here to be this transformative medicine. Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to pass it back in a second, but I want to um, just close with a blessing that Jerry Teo, when I was doing the Boys and Men of Color work, I remember Jerry Teo, we were doing this gathering with a bunch of Boys and Men of Color. This is years ago. And he, and he, you know, got down on, the, you know, an eye level with them. And he said to them, you know, I'm not going to show you all these statistics. You know, all these things, these are your fathers, these are your brothers, you know? And he said, and he just kept saying over and over to them, you are loved. You are blessing. You are sacred just the way you are. And that has been such a big thing. You know, for anyone who's on this call, please know that you are loved. You're a blessing and you're sacred just the way you are. You have dignity and you have wisdom and gifts for the world. And we're grateful that you were with us tonight. Mm -hmm. And I'm grateful for you, Pat, for all the medicine you shared tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I know. I know Kira is probably going to come back in a sec. Yeah. Um, I want to thank everyone who is here. I'm going to save the chat because people saved some, said some things in the chat. I want to save. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. i pass it back to you, Kira. Wow. Brenda and Pat, just thank you so much. I just really appreciated this conversation so much. And I think um, it's just going to be appreciated by all the people who it's going to reach out and touch 
you are both such a blessing, both of you. Mm. Yeah. And thank you to all of you who've joined us from all around the world tonight. Um, again, we'll have recordings produced in about two weeks on our website at tns.commonweal.org. Be sure to find The New School on YouTube, SoundCloud, Apple Podcasts, or Spotify, and like and subscribe for more conversations about nature, culture, and inner life. Brenda Salgado and Pat McCabe, thank you for joining us at The New School at Commonweal. We'll see you all next time. Don't take it, don't, don't, don't. 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 The river is a healer. The river is a saint. The river knows no 